And so we're going to look at the first four centuries of the Christian era. And our focus will be on certain key figures. We're going to look, for example, at St. Irenaeus of Lyon, the early Alexandrians, Clement and Origen. We're going to look at St. Athanasius the Great and the Arian controversy. And after that, we're going to focus in a special way on the great Cappadocian fathers and their contribution, specifically in the context of the Eunomian controversy, the later Arians, and St. John Chrysostom. And we will attempt a comparison on the Trinitarian question in particular, but not only, a comparison with St. Augustine of Hippo. But first, we're going to begin by looking at the language of Holy Scripture. Then I want to briefly compare the, the biblical approach to that of the philosophers, and in particular the Greek philosophy of the early Christian period. And thirdly, the last part of the introduction will be to look at a very interesting and important figure, Philo of Alexandria, who is an Alexandrian rabbi who is a near contemporary of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, and to look at the way that he brings together in his person those two elements. Of course, in his case, we're speaking of the Old Testament, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and looking at how he seeks to approach his intellectual contemporaries and introduce them to the God of the Bible. But let me begin with a quotation from St. Siloan the Athenite, where we read the following words, and this is in his chapter on the knowledge of God. We may study as much as we will, but we shall still not come to know the Lord unless we live according to his commandments. For the Lord is not made known through learning, but by the Holy Spirit. Many philosophers and scholars have arrived at a belief in the existence of God, but they have not come to know God. And we monks apply ourselves day and night to the study of the Lord's command, but not all of us by a long way have come to know the Lord, although we believe in him. To believe that God exists is one thing, to know God another. That's from St. Siloan the Athenite, page 354. Yes, to believe that God exists is one thing, to know God another. Let's begin our journey then with a look at the language of Holy Scripture and in particular let's compare two interesting and contrasting narratives the one the first from Exodus and the second from the first synoptic gospel of Matthew so the first, Exodus 33, verses 18 to 23. And Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, 
Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Now Matthew chapter 16, verse 28, to chapter 17, verse 9. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. As they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Show me thy glory. Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 we read that wonderful that wonderful phrase for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What do we mean by mystical theology? In the West, in the post-Augustinian Western theological tradition, mystical theology is often understood as a marginal theology, a theology that is reserved for those who are described as mystics, usually interesting persons, fascinating even, who have at some time or other been accused of heresy. 
in the Orthodox tradition, in the tradition of the fathers of the church, the tradition of the saints, mystical theology is theology. There is no other theology. Orthodox theology is mystical theology because mystikos is a term that comes from the verb mio, which means to initiate, to introduce one to. Mystical theology, first and foremost, in the Orthodox patristic tradition, and there is no other tradition, is the face-to-face -face encounter with God himself. So, theology, the knowledge of God, is all about man's experience of God. That face-to-face -face encounter. It concerns also, therefore, the road to this encounter. The manner by which this encounter may be achieved. And its final goal, its final purpose, is nothing less than communion and eternal union with God. Now, in the language of Holy Scripture, we notice that certain words, certain symbols are used in particular. And the word symbol is used here advisedly because it comes from the verb simvalin, which means to draw together. In the Fathers, symbols are not mere visual reminders. Symbols, as Metropolitan Callistos Ware maintains, often reach further, say more than a reasoned argument. They say more, more compactly than a logical explanation. So, what symbols in particular did the fathers find useful? Did they find helpful? We're going to look at the two main symbols of light and darkness. And both of them are to be found in the life of Moses who is seen by a number of writers, both Jewish and Christian, as a symbol of the way. Let's take, for example, Exodus chapter 24, verses 9 to 11, which says, Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. And as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, also, they saw God and did eat and drink. Clearness, radiance, clarity, sapphire stone. And in Exodus 24, 15 to 18, we find references to the glory of God and to a flaming fire. And Moses went up into the mount 
and a cloud covered the mount, and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and gat him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. And also in Numbers chapter 12, verse 8, we read, With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And he has seen the glory of the Lord. Not in dark speeches. Not by enigmas, literally, according to the Septuagint. And compare this for a brief moment to the reference to light as opposed to darkness in 1 John 1 5 this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all what about darkness then for example we have the famous verse of Exodus 20, 21, and Moses went into the darkness or the thick dark cloud where God was. Not skodos, which is darkness pure and simple, but gnophos, darkness, the thick dark cloud. Does darkness mean that Moses does not see God? Does this mean that what he sees, what he perceives, is beyond vision per se? That is beyond the senses. In Psalm 17, 11, or Psalm 18, 11, in the King James, the Masoretic text. He made darkness his secret place. Round about him was his tabernacle, even dark water in the clouds of the air. Now, we need to distinguish different levels of darkness. First of all, we know that there is the the darkness of ignorance, sin. As in 1 John 1, 5 to 8, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So there's the darkness of ignorance, identified with sin. There is another form of darkness, we find it not in an orthodox writer, but in John of the Cross, one of the Spanish mystics. And I'm referring to the darkness of purgation, as John of the Cross describes it. As you know, John of the Cross speaks of the dark night of the soul. And John of the Cross puts forward 
his own method. And John's prayer, significantly for the Orthodox, does not begin with repentance. But it strives towards visionary, imaginative experience. which is at variance with the practice of prayer in the orthodox patristic tradition. Two things really, perhaps they boil down to the same thing. The use of the imagination in prayer is not encouraged in the orthodox tradition and we certainly do not expect to see things. It's true, we have already spoken of the vision of God, the face-to-face -face vision of God and so forth. But there's a difference and a significant one between desiring to see God and expecting to see him. It's a subtle but significant difference. More about that in due course. But for the third level of darkness, we are referring to now divine darkness, which is certainly not the same as the darkness of purgation as presented by John of the Cross, because it represents the journey's end. And it is a positive symbol which expresses not separation, but union with God. Which, of course, is the ultimate goal. Now, the great advantage of symbols is that one can use apparently contradictory symbols without, in fact, contradicting oneself. As, for example, in the following scriptural passage. This from Psalm 138, verse 12. For darkness will not be darkness with thee, but night will be light as day. As its darkness, so shall its night be to thee. And as we shall see later, in much more detail, these conjunctions of opposites are much beloved by Dionysius the Areopagite, who uses such phrases as a dazzling darkness or a supraluminous darkness, the ray of divine darkness. And in, for example, his fifth letter, Dionysius says, the divine darkness is that unapproachable light where God is said to live. And if it is invisible because of a superabundant clarity, if it cannot be approached because of the outpouring of its transcendent gift of light, yet it is here that is found everyone worthy to know God and to look upon him. And let's uh, compare that to 1 Timothy chapter 6, 16. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see. So we've already referred once or twice to the New Testament. So let's turn now to the language of the New Testament where we can find the following important passages. These passages refer directly to man's participation in God. So first, 2 Peter 1, chapter 1 verses 3 to 4, according as his divine power hath given unto us 
all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, that we might become partakers of the divine nature. Is this mere rhetorical exaggeration a metaphor or does he mean what he says? Take the following verses from John chapter 17, 5 to 24, pass him here and there. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And from verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So this passage, and others like it in St. John, is replete with theological meaning. Again, the question is, are we dealing with metaphor? Are we merely playing with words? Or can we truly say that his life is mine? So this is what St. Paul says in Galatians 3, 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And in Romans chapter 6, he says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed 
unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then, shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were freed from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And back to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, where St. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, such passages can be read in a mystical or in a non-mystical way. But the fathers say that St. Paul means what he says. We may refer to the following examples of texts which speak of a direct even of a complete vision of God, such as 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Note the implication that in order to see God as he is, we must be like him. And 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. But then shall I know, even also as I am known. But to this we have the apparent contradistinction in the well-known assertion in John, 1 John 4.12, that no man hath seen God 
at any time. Θεόν ουδείς πόποτε τε θέατε. And indeed also 1 Timothy 6.16 as we read before who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto whom no man hath seen nor can see. So the fundamental paradox evident in scripture is the revelation of a God who is at one and the same time unknown and yet known, a God who is simultaneously beyond us and yet closer to us even than our own hearts. Now, changing gears for a moment to look at what we find in Greek philosophy on the question of the knowledge of God. So far we've looked at mystical theology in the language of Holy Scripture and in particular at the symbols of light and darkness in biblical descriptions of man's encounter with God. We looked at how these symbols, light, clarity, glory on the one hand, and the dark cloud, dimness and darkness on the other, were used to denote God's knowability and his unknowability, his transcendence and his nearness. In other words, we looked at how Scripture affirms the real and direct participation of us creatures in the great God, I am, whilst at the same time affirming his otherness as the only uncreated one. But although Christianity originally emerged from a Jewish background, it was to develop and flourish in a Greco-Roman a Hellenistic culture. Thus we come to the perennial question. Was Christianity Hellenized or was Hellenism Christianized? Now in order to appreciate further the language used by the fathers, in order to gain a fuller background for our understanding of patristic mystical theology, let us turn for a moment from scriptural tradition to the tradition of the Greek philosophers, and in particular to the Platonic tradition, and look at its contribution to the question of the quest for participation in God. Why, you may well ask, do we need to bother with philosophy? What does philosophy have to do with theology? Or, in the words of Tertullian, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? For us Orthodox, I think the short answer to this question is the same as Tertullian's. Nothing whatever. But, in order to understand why this is so, and why the orthodox answer to this question is so different to the answer given by Western Christendom, it is necessary to acquaint ourselves a little with the more serious elements of philosophy. And in our attempt to do so, let's not forget that true philosophy, like true theology, is based on a way of life. Indeed, True philosophy, as Socrates says in Plato's Phaedo, 64a, is a preparation for death, even though Socrates' understanding of death is quite different to the Christian understanding. To what extent then, if any, has Christianity been influenced by the pagan world? Perhaps it should be explicitly stated right from the outset that the orthodox view of the church's struggle to preserve the true faith regards false philosophy, that is, philosophy which is based on speculation 
and the powers of the human mind alone as the chief evil. Ultimately, all the heresies were based on human rather than on divine knowledge. The fathers therefore strove to cleanse our minds of misconceptions which had their roots in a false philosophy, in a false way of life. What does the Platonic tradition have to say then about the divine? Firstly, we find a negative dialectic, the apophatic approach expressed in Socrates' famous dictum, the one thing I know is that I know nothing. En either, or do you then either? And also in Plato's Parmenides, 142a, the one has no name, he says, nor is there any description or knowledge or perception or opinion of it. That's about as apathetic as you can get. And then, in Plotinus, the, the middle Platonist of the 3rd century, in his Enneads, Book 5, Section 3, Paragraph 14, we read, For we say what God is not, but we do not say what God is. Again, these passages and others like them give us an apophatic approach to God. What we cannot say about the divine. The apophatic approach can, however, lead to an affirmation if used positively. As Cardinal John Henry Newman liked to say, theology is saying and unsaying to a positive effect. What about the cataphatic approach? Well, in Plato's Republic, Book 6, we have positive statements which actually, I'm not so sure how cataphatic they are in, in the end, but he says the good is, that's a cataphatic statement, right? But it is not a being, it's not an usia, but in dignity and being is beyond being. And in his Timaeus 28c, Plato says that the creator and father of the universe is difficult to find, and when he is found, it is impossible to proclaim him to all. Plotinus says that God is beyond being, beyond activity, and beyond mind and thought. Ultimately, again, more apophatic than cataphatic. What does Plotinus mean by beyond mind and thought, or beyond intellect and intellection? Beyond conception. That's a good intuition from an orthodox perspective. But it's clear that Plotinus is referring to a level of existence which exists beyond that of the nous, the, the intellect or the mind, as it's variously translated into English, beyond that of the nous. Let's take a moment to remind ourselves of the Neoplatonic ontology, the, the Neoplatonic metaphysical view of the universe. First of all, in the Neoplatonic hierarchy of the cosmos, we have the one, God. The one is beyond being, ebekina disusias, very Platonic, very familiar terminology, above and beyond being, indivisible, unchanging, eternal, without past or future, a constant self-identity. Then we have the level of the nous, 
which is, again, philosophically, it's translated as, as mind, intellect, sometimes thought. But this is intuition or immediate apprehension and is identified with the demiurge. It is the repository of the whole multitude of ideas residing within it indivisibly. Nous, which is also identified as beauty, is eternal and beyond time and sees all in an eternal present. That's the immediate apprehension. Then we have the soul, the third, as it were, in the metaphysical order of the cosmos. And the soul corresponds to the world soul of Plato's Timaeus. It's incorporeal and indivisible, it forms the connecting link between the supersensual world and the sensual world. It proceeds from nous, but its objects are successive. Plato also makes an important distinction between dianoia, discursive thinking, or reasoning, as in mathematics, and noesis, or intuitive thinking, or intellection, which is superior to the former. In his Republic, Book 6, 509D to 511E, he gives us this uh, distinction, and it's a very important passage on the question of participation. In his seventh epistle, Plato says of the ultimate knowledge that it does not admit at all of verbal expression like other studies, but as a result of continued application to the subject itself and communion therewith, it is brought to birth in the soul on a sudden, as light that is kindled by a leaping spark and thereafter it nourishes itself. It's brought to birth in the soul on a sudden, as light that is kindled by a leaping spark. It's interesting that there's no mention of darkness in Plato. Now, we do, of course, have the image or the analogy of the cave in Plato's Republic, which is mentioned in connection with the, the sun, which is used as an analogy for the form of goodness. And the cave provides us with a graphic description of human nature. All we are is chained prisoners looking at shadows of reality. From shadows to the images from which the shadows come. And so there are two kinds of knowledge according to Plato. There's opinion and then there's knowledge proper. Opinion is guessing, faith which exercises itself upon sensory objects. And then we have episteme, which is knowledge of the real world, which is that which lies hidden from our senses, available to us through the exercise of the mind alone. It's interesting that Plato's view of the reality is the opposite to what we have today. Platonists believed that reality lay beyond the senses, whereas today, very often, our comprehension of knowledge takes exactly the opposite view. Only that which is perceptible to the senses is considered to be real. 
Plato and company never trusted the senses. In the world of knowledge, the last thing to be perceived and only with great difficulty is the essential form of goodness, the idea of goodness. Plotinus refers explicitly to a vision of light, but interestingly, we do not see anything in the light. Light is the vision for Plotinus and his fellow Neoplatonists. So, in Plotinus, we pass into ecstasy beyond self awareness, and according to Porphyry, Plotinus's disciple and friend, in the life of Plotinus, section 23, Porphyry says that Plotinus experienced this illumination at least four times in Porphyry's presence. Knowledge, participation, illumination, opinion, the apophatic approach. There's a lot more that we could say about the philosophical tradition of the ancient world into which Christianity entered. But in summing up this brief section, interestingly, we can already see that there are three features which distinguish the Platonic tradition from Christianity. So firstly, the one, the good, is not a personal divinity. In the tradition of Plato, Aristotle, and the others. We are drawn to it, but it does not love us. There's no sign that it is particularly conscious of us. We said that the one was self-identity, constant self-identity like the unmoved mover of Aristotle, which can only be aware of itself. Otherwise, it would be involved in the life of the cosmos, in that eternal coming into being and passing out of existence, in the world of motion and change. And as perfect, the unmoved mover, or the good, or the one, or the truly existent one, cannot be aware of any of that. Must be totally, totally detached. So it moves all things, but it itself must remain unaffected, uninfluenced, unmoved. So, we are drawn to it, but it does not love us. This was a problem that Aquinas had to deal with as he took Aristotelian concepts and categories and tried to use them in favor of, of Christianity because you have to do all kinds of gymnastics which Aquinas did in order to reach the point where you say there is and there can be and there certainly is divine providence. Because with the unmoved mover, there's not much room for anything other than itself. Secondly, then, we have the understanding that the ascent to God consists in a flight from the body, an escape from the material world, the realm of the physical senses. And the ascent to God involves only the nous, not the body. Porphyry, in chapter 1 of his Life of Plotinus, says that 
Plotinus was ashamed of his body. He never told anyone when his birthday was. Becoming intertwined with, encumbered by the materiality of a physical body is a great tragedy. The very least, a very unfortunate parenthesis in true human existence. True existence being the, the life of the soul. So behind this disparaging view of the body, we have nothing less than a rejection of the body, of history, and of the world. This means that Platonism cannot believe in the Incarnation, as indeed St. Augustine tells us in his Confessions, Book 7, Section 9. But it should also be noted that there is not as strict a dualism in Platonism as we would sometimes like to think. The strict dualistic view of spirit as good, matter explicitly identified as evil, comes with dualistic religious systems. The early Christian heresies had that. But Platonism itself, even Plotinus, never actually say, they don't have much good to say about materiality in the body, but they never actually identify it as evil. Now thirdly, and this is very important, and it's so familiar to us really, because it's all around us today, that the soul is regarded as itself by nature divine. And so we see in Platonism a natural kinship between the soul and God. That the highest part of us human beings is divine by nature. There's the famous passage in the second chapter of Porphyry's Life of Plotinus where gathered around Plotinus's deathbed, Plotinus says to his disciples, try to bring back the God in us to the divine in the all. McKenna's translation, famous translation of Stephen McKenna, is considered better, and it says, strive to give back the divine in yourselves to the divine in the all. Well, you can see quite clearly what is implied by that statement. It's precisely this natural kinship of the soul and God, that the highest, most noble part of the human being is in fact divine by nature. And of course that's problematic from a Christian perspective because as we see, it's the difference between what you hear some people saying and among them certain celebrities today who are influenced by this kind of metaphysic. They say, we must be thankful. And if you ask them the question, to whom are you thankful when you believe that you are divine by nature? And of course... The whole Christian life is based on thanksgiving. Eucharist, the central mystery of the Christian faith, and how many times in the prayers that the priest reads, the Eucharistic prayers, does he say that we thank God for bringing us into being out of non-being, out of nothing, and, and so on. Fundamentally, then, we're able to see that what we have is a two different worlds. In the biblical approach, the whole human person, body and soul, is a creature created by God. And created means ex nihilo, out of nothing. While in the Platonist approach, no distinction exists between the created 
and the uncreated. The chief line of demarcation is thus between God, the soul, on the one hand, and then the body. In Platonism, we have a descending hierarchy in the universe. The divine one, the nous, the kindred divine souls, at varying distances from the one, and finally bodies or matter. In the philosophical tradition, they do use the term created or creature, but when they do, they understand it in terms of matter receiving a form. So everything is pre-existent, including the stuff out of which the furniture of the universe is made. But then the demiurge, which as we said in the Neoplatonic metaphysic is identified with the nous, gives this amorphous material a shape. And that shape informs it, gives it that form. It gives it a form and a function. So the form determines its function and one thing is thereby differentiated from another. But everything is uncreated. Everything pre-exists. There is no such thing as something out of nothing. So, again, a very fundamentally different metaphysic. There is no distinction between the created and the uncreated. The distinction is between soul or spirit and matter or flesh. And of course, in the Western theological tradition, this philosophical distinction has played a greater role and acquired a more important place and is the main distinction. Whereas in the patristic tradition, the fundamental distinction is between the created and the uncreated. And only God, God himself, is uncreated. Everything else is created, meaning out of nothing. In the post-Augustinian Western theological tradition, you have this blurring of the created-uncreated distinction and it being superseded, in effect, by the spirit-matter distinction. The spirit-matter distinction does exist in the orthodox patristic tradition. But it is not the fundamental distinction, it's not the first distinction. And you'll see when we come to such important figures as Maximus the Confessor, you'll see that that is in fact how he presents things. Everything is based on the distinction between the created and the uncreated. Now I know that there are Speaking of the philosophical tradition, I know that there is the view that, you know, the kind of thing that we find in St. Justin, the martyr and philosopher, which is more generous towards philosophy and says that there are seeds of the truth to be found in philosophy. And so, yes, that is certainly the case. Wherever the truth is to be found, we as Christians understand that this is given by God and points to Christ. It is a seed, an element, an opportunity to preach the truth which is Christ. And we see that very clearly in the book of Acts with St. Paul on Mars Hill preaching to the philosophers about the unknown God, the altar that they made to the unknown God. That is true, and what we're going to look at, actually after Philo, is the very skeptical approach towards philosophy which we find in Irenaeus of Lyon, and the more generous approach that is represented by the Alexandrians, Clement, and origin. But before we turn to them, I want to 
talk to you about this fascinating figure, Philo of Alexandria, who is so highly regarded, especially by the early fathers of the church, as a Christian before Christ. But I will reserve that for next time.